Southwest Asia consists of the entire countries and territories that lie to the west of Afghanistan. This is a region pretty significant from the perspective of examination. For example, most of the questions that have been asked correlated with correlated geography with international relations, international relations with locations, locations with some type of characteristics have been in a different years and they have been in world geography they have been the topics which have been asked. For example, as you can go to see it on your screen, in 2017 one of these questions was on Mediterranean Sea. That is Mediterranean Sea is the border of uh, which of the following countries have. Now that is an observation based question. If you are taking a look at it, you are going to find it is an observation based question where facts do not go to play a major role at all. In 2015, there was another of this question that was in Golan Heights. So the area known as Golan Heights is sometimes appears in the news in the context of events related to. Now, of course, it is going to be <coughs> uh, Middle East essentially because that is in Israel and that is also going to be called by the name of Middle East. And this was again an observation based question and a very a very generalized level of awareness that was required of the candidates in this case here. The third of this question that was asked the same year, which of the following countries of Southwest Asia does not open out to the Mediterranean. Now there is again an observation base because if you are taking a look at the map, you will go on to understand that which of these countries, is it Jordan, is it Lebanon, which of them is going to be landlocked there. So, of course, in this case, it is going to be Jordan that is landlocked and that is doesn't open to us Mediterranean. In 2014, uh, again, an, a, a major question that has been asked in world geography has been asked on this topic. Uh, recently, a series of uprisings of people referred to as Arab Spring uh, originally started from Egypt, Lebanon, Syria, Tunisia, and that was from the same region. And of course, it may not go on to belong to pure blue blooded geography. But then it does go on to have a good amount of geographical tinge in it. And then the second question that was asked considered the following pairs region in news country, in the region in the news, in region of in news, and then the country of it. So, Chesnaya, Russian Federation, Darfur, Mali, Swat Valley, Iraq. So, this is, this is somewhat factual, but then. It's not too factual as to someone has to strain himself or herself. Which of the above pairs is correctly matched? In this case, that was Darfur to Mali, Swat Valley to Iraq, is it in Afghanistan, Chechnya, there is Russian Federation. That was what was to be located. We understand that part and consequently we are taking a journey all the way towards the southwest of Asia. We will take a journey all the way to the West Asia beginning with Afghanistan, then to Iran, then to Iraq, then to Turkey, then we will go to come into the Mediterranean Sea region that is Cyprus covering the whole of Levant countries that is Cyprus, that is Syria, that is Jordan, that is going to be Israel, all of these countries and coming on to the Red Sea region and thereafter cover the whole of the Arabian Peninsula. So three regions in three different sections. One comprising of Afghanistan, Iran, Iraq and Turkey. The second is comprising of the Levant countries yeah? and the third is the Arabian Peninsula. That's the way the journey goes on to begin and we'll go on to move from west and then west going to enter into Persian Gulf and then come out of the Red Sea. Beginning with Afghanistan. Afghanistan is a landlocked country located within South Asia and Central Asia. Afghanistan is bordered by Pakistan in the south and east, Iran in the west, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan and Tajikistan in the north and far northeast China and the Pakistani administered Gilgit Balitistan region Indian occupied what we are going to be calling it or it is going to be Gilgit Balitistan region of India. 
Much of Afghanistan is covered by the Hindu Kush mountain ranges. Hindu Kush mountains runs towards the west from the Pamir north to the Ilburj mountains in Iran. The Suleiman range proceeds southward from the Pamir north along the border between Pakistan and Afghanistan broken by a pass that is called as Khyber linking Pakistan with Afghanistan. Now this is the place where a question can go on to be asked and that is about uh, which have been one of these passes that have provided uh, some amount of a passageway for all of those invaders from central asia to come to india that indeed is khyber pass the north of afghanistan consists of fertile plains uh, while the southwest consists of deserts uh, extending itself into the baluchistan desert Bordering Afghanistan is a Balochistan province and is Pakistan's largest territory but because Afghanistan is landlocked and because Balochistan happens to be comprising a good number of people that are from that old gear a leggings towards Afghanistan that is the region that is going to be considered as part of a geographical extension so bordering Afghanistan is Balochistan province and is Pakistan's largest territory but the least populated province gwadar the warm water deep sea port developed with the chinese help in this region gwadar is a port of uh, that is part of china's maritime silk route project which lies in baluchistan and is pakistan's main energy provider the almost 50 billion dollar china pakistan economic corridor cpec runs through the province The Baluch people have their set of grievances from Pakistan and given a choice they are likely to move away from Pakistan. This is largely because of many reasons. One of them is a attempt by the Pak government to change the demography of Baluchistan which has a anger and which has peeved the Baluch people. The second is a Baluch people have been denied a fair share of the natural gas revenue and they This is one of the most important economic exploitations that is taking place of the Baluch people. The third is associated with the province which remains one of the most backward of the provinces in the whole of the region and this backwardness ranges from any yardstick of backwardness. Afghanistan has been the site of other than other than Balochistan Afghanistan has been the site of the great games which has been fought here for the control of the province as a geopolitical entity of course the most important of it has been recent times have been uh, the soviet occupation that took place from 1979 and then the american presence in this region afghanistan happens to be one of those countries which provides a uh, interior and accessibility to almost all the country towards the east of afghanistan west of afghanistan and uh, towards the north of afghanistan that means uh, towards pakistan towards central asia and towards uh, iran as well the other region of any significance is the herat province in afghanistan afghan india friendship dam that is formerly the selmai dam is a hydroelectric irrigation project uh, which has been herat province uh, which is located on the hari river and uh, kishti sharif district of herat province in this western part of uh, afghanistan The second region of any significance happens to be in Nangarhar province of eastern Afghanistan which has been known for United States conducting an air strike in this region and United States in this place conducted an air strike and dropped one of the mo- one of the largest of the non nuclear bombs in its arsenal which was called by the name of massive ordnance air blast moab that is a it's also going to be called in slang by the name of mother of all bombs moab which is a large yield bomb developed by the united states military and is of course said to be the largest non nuclear weapon in the american arsenal west of afghanistan lies iran iran also known as persia is the second largest country in the middle east iran is bordered to the northwest by armenia the republic of azerbaijan and the azerbaijani exclave of nakhchivan to the north by the caspian sea 
to the north east it is by Turkmenistan and to the east it is by Afghanistan and Pakistan. To the south it has Persian Gulf which is sometimes also going to be now called as Arabian Gulf and the Gulf of Oman and of course lies towards its west and southwest is Turkey and Iraq. The Iranian geography consists of some mountains and a central plateau. In the north, west, from where Armenia north begins, in the northwest lays the central north that is Armenian north, from which many mountains either emerge or radiate or they are going to converge. That is, they emerge from that region or they are going to converge in that place. Now, that goes on to include the Taurus and the Pontic mountain ranges running to the northwest of Armenian north and ultimately ends in Turkey. It is not part of uh, Iran's geographical personality. The Ilburj Mountains is an extension of the Hindu Kush Mountains of Afghanistan, which covers uh, northeast of Iran before converging into the Armenian north. The Jagros lies to the southeast of Iran before terminating in the Armenian north. Moreover, the Jagros runs all along the Makran coast. That coast is going to be called by Makran coast. Now, what anyone has to observe here is a question that can be framed here can go on to be Arrange the following geographical features of Iran running all the way from Persian Gulf towards the Caspian Sea. And that will go on to comprise Makran coast, that will go on to comprise Jagros mountains, that will go on to comprise the central plateau of Iran and then Elburz mountains and then that is going to be the Caspian Sea region. Now that can go to be an observation based question which can possibly be asked from this place. In between the Jagros and the Elburz lies Iran's central plateau. In the central plateau of Iran lies Dasht e Kavir. Dasht e Kavir happens to be the largest salt desert in the world. So, deserts are of various types. They can be sandy deserts, this can be stony deserts. On a desert, the underlying surface of which goes on to be salt is going to be called by the name of a salty desert. And that is also having a Lake One, which is the third saltiest body of water in the world after Don Juan Pond and Lake Casal in Zivoti. The country's central location in Eurasia and Western Asia and its proximity to the Strait of Hormuz gives it an immense geographical and geostrategic significance here. And it is, it is indeed so. Iran is uh, separated from the Arabian Peninsula by the Persian Gulf. It is this Persian Gulf having Hormuz Strait that goes on to be so significant. The Persian Gulf is significant and uh, has been uh, seeing uh, changing uh, geopolitics uh, in this, uh, played in this region. The Strait of Hormuz with Bandar Abbas as a port, uh, a port is a gulf of uh, uh, immense strategic significance uh, because it is a choke point uh, and uh, it is this choke point that can be used tactically as well as strategically. If you go on to take a look on the map, you are going to find it uh, that there are going to be several such type of choke points in the whole of uh, Asia. Hormuz is going to be one of them and then uh, Babel Mandeb Strait, uh, where Sukhutra is located, that is going to be another of these type of a choke point uh, in the western portion of Asia. So, Hormuz Strait is significant uh, because of uh, many reasons, uh, but it is no more as significant as it used to be. This is because there has been a uh, because of the steady rise in the production of oil from Canada's tar sands, uh, which hold more oil than Saudi Arabia's resource. So, no one is interested in this place. The second discovery is the discovery of massive pre-salt oil fields, which is offshore of Brazil. And Brazil has become a major exporter in this case. Of course, the dependence of the Western countries on the Persian Gulf oil has decreased. The third development has been the development of a new, track, new technology called as fracking, which has made it possible to extract oil from oil shale. By 2020, US oil imports will go on to dip and will be met entirely from the neighbors of America, ending the US dependence on the Persian Gulf. This would lead to a substantial US military withdrawal from the Gulf and that has already taken place to a very large extent. 
This is simply another way of saying that the traditional US dependence on the Gulf is going to disappear. However, there are three major developments that are going to be still making the whole of Persian Gulf pretty significant. First, because of the mistrust US has towards the Arabian countries, the Gulf and its oil will still be strategically demanded, that is strategically demanded will be very high. That means the strategic demand of oil will be very high. Because of the mistrust US has towards the Arab countries and they, it's vice versa as well. Second is uh, the, uh, that is uh, NATO partners and uh, above all of them Japan will continue to need oil from the Gulf countries uh, and uh, US will have to ensure the supplies of this oil to this NATO country. Japan is going to be a major weapon in the armory of the US uh, largely because of uh, a sudden meteoric rise of China. Third is any interruption in the Gulf supplies will go on to send the oil prices soaring very high. And uh, it is a uh, when this happens, uh, then uh, the US will have to import oil from Canada or even from Saudi Arabia. So, a control over the Persian Gulf oil is always going to be significant. Thus, the US will retain some interest in smooth oil flows from the Gulf, even if its own imports from the region fail to do anything at all in this case. The US also wants a major oil imports to bear a larger share of the cost of polishing the waters in and out of the Gulf. Japan, which is currently the largest importer from the Gulf, but soon the, it will be replaced by China, with India a distant third. Japan's constitution limits its own defense spending. So China looks like first supplementing and then replacing US naval dominance in the United States. Pakistan has asked China, rather it has begged China, to use the Gwadar port as a naval base. However, Gwadar will be an ideal future location for policing the Gulf because Gwadar is located right at the entrance of a of the Persian Gulf. It is to checkmate Gwadar that India has a constructed Chahbahar. The land operated port in Iran's Chahbahar would open a gateway for India to Afghanistan and Central Asia. This port is of a strategic significance to India. Chahbahar is crucial because it sits at the mouth of a Strait of Hormuz area and it is at the junction of shipping, oil trade routes uh, and something like one, almost uh, one lakh ships, uh, one lakh ships uh, sail on an yearly basis. Uh. The second is, the location of the port is significant, it is located only 72 kilometers away from Gwadar. Thus, uh, once functional, uh, Chahabar will offset China's growing influence and reach in the region uh, and will further undermine uh, Gwadar's significance. Uh. The third is, uh, it connects three regions. Chahabar connects three regions, Central Asia, South Asia and West Asia, all three of them. Fourth is, Chahabar will force the closer ties with Iran and will allow India to secure cheaper energy imports. So it is very, very significant from an Indian perspective. Chahabar has also hold on two thirds of the world's oil reserves. Chahabar port route helps connect India with energy rich Azerbaijan, Turkmenistan and other Central Asian countries. Six is, it gives India a strategic heft in the region. It will go on to giving uh, some degree of a uh, heavy weight uh, for mileage to India. It helps it bypass Pakistan to come to Afghanistan and to move to Afghanistan and build closer ties with Iran and Afghanistan. There are possibilities that uh, Pakistan may not go to allow its air space to be used by India and that's the only way China, India can go on to enter into Iran and then Afghanistan. More so with the recent uh, Garnel, uh, Garland uh, Canal scheme uh, in this region, the region goes on to hold a very good significance. Uh, it is through this Garland uh, region uh, and this Garland uh, routeways, transportation ways uh, that India will go on to strengthen its ties with the region. Seventh is, the route is 70% shorter, 30% less expensive than uh, via the Red Sea Suez Canal Mediterranean route. 
of course for the purpose of obtaining its oil. It is in the absence of a transit through Pakistan, Iran is India's gateway to Afghanistan, Central Asia and Russia and beyond it as well and the Chahabahar port is a key element in that. Ninth is, while the Chahabar port is essentially meant for commercial purposes and provides a transit route to Afghanistan, India can use this facility to monitor Pakistani and Chinese activity in the entire of the Indian Ocean region, particularly in this Hormuz Gulf region as well. And it is, of course, going to be doubly useful for the purpose of monitoring the Pakistani Navy. Tenth is, Indian investment in the port would serve as a link to Dilaram Zaranze Road that India has built in Afghanistan. Chahabahar port will give India base to position itself from in, uh, after international troops go on to withdraw from Afghanistan and they have withdrawn. So, with respect to Dilaram Zaranze, it can go on to enter itself into Central Asian territory as well. Eleventh is, India built Zaranze Dilaram Road in Afghanistan will connect to Chahabahar port via Milak. Iran, that is Milak is in Iran, and that is financial aid of India, uh, it will go on to upgrade the Chahabar Milak roadway as well. And lastly, the Chahabar Milak Jaranj Dilaram Highway will open up the Indian market to Afghan farm products and other exports. It will also help combat the scourge of illicit drugs production and export and assist trade, transport, and transit network of Iran. So, Development of the Chahabahar port is going to be all very, very, very significant and very substantial also in this case. The NSTC essentially passes through this port of Iran. It, it just goes on to touch Bandar Bas as one of its and as you can go on to see from the map, it has a, a, it has a complete circle made through this region. Other than Bandar Abbas, they are going to be significant three places in Iran that is of, that is uh, going to be of a stretching and economic significance. Uh. The first is Abadan. Abadan has a coastal location and at some time it had the biggest oil refinery in the whole of the world till it was destroyed by the Iran-Iraq war. Second has been Ahwaz. Ahwaz is one of the best known petroleum fields in this region and Karman Shah which is also going to be known for its petroleum deposits. With its recent collection of cloud and a possible desire to lead the Islamic world, Iran has started building its influence throughout the Gulf and the Arabian Peninsula. And that is very, very evident. Again, as part of this map that goes on to show you. Iran has been known for its environmental crusades, particularly some of these environmental conferences. And one of these conferences uh, converts itself into Ramsar Convention for Wetland Conservation. Ramsar is a place uh, on the Caspian Sea front uh, which was known by the name of Saksa in the past. Uh, Ramsar Convention is one of the most important convention for the purpose of con for the conservation of the wetlands. West and south of it uh, is going to be Iraq. Iraq has a coastline on the northern Persian Gulf and encompasses the Mesopotamian alluvial plain, the north western end of the Zagros mountain range and the eastern part of the Syrian desert with which it merges imperceptibly. The Tigris Euphrates, originating from the Iranian plateau, drains itself into Iraq through Shat al Arab. Shat al Arab is a waterway in the same mold as a it is in Argentina and it is, it is over this waterway that Iraq and Iran, both of them, went on to fight almost an eight-year war. Essentially, that was for the purpose of sharing of the water resources. The region between the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers, historically known as Mesopotamia, is referred to as the cradle of civilization because a good number of cultures emerged out of this place. Iraq is bordered by Turkey to the north, Iran to the east, Kuwait to the southeast, Saudi Arabia to the south, Jordan towards the southwest, and, area, and Syria to the west. Now imagine this part, it is going to be Turkey to the north, Iran east, Kuwait southeast, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, and then Syria. The question that can be framed here is which of these countries do not go on to fringe Iraq from every side? 
The main ethnic groups of uh, in uh, Iraq happen to be Arabs and the Kurds. Others go on to include Assyrians, Turkmen, uh, Shabakis, uh, Yazidis, Armenians, uh, Mandians, uh, Circassians, uh, and Kualia. And Iraq is always going to be trouble prone and the three cities in Iraq which are constantly in news uh, because they are in trouble or they create trouble is Mosul is one of them. Mosul is the principal manufacturing center of Iraq and the site of petrochemical, electrical and food processing industry. Second is Kirkuk. Kirkuk is known for its crude oil and it has a crude oil field that is going to be sent through top line for oil refineries located in Banias in Syria. And Basra is the chief port and commercial center of Iraq. West of it, west of Iraq and Iran, both of them lies Turkey. Turkey, lying towards the west of Iran and northwest of Iraq, is a transcontinental country in Eurasia, meaning half of it lies in Asia, almost 97% of it, 3% lies in Europe. The Asian part of the country is comprising mostly of the peninsula of Anatolia and Antonian Peninsula which consists of a high central plateau with narrow coastal plains uh, located between two ranges, Koroglu and Pontic mountain ranges to the north. That is the tier two mountain ranges, Koroglu and Pontic in the north and south is going to be Taurus mountain ranges. Uh. The Pontic mountain ranges uh, running to the, to the northwest of Armenian north uh, forms its northern boundary. The Taurus mountain range running to the southwest of Armenian north uh, runs parallel to the Mediterranean coast of Turkey. The plateau of Anatolia is enclosed between Pontic mountains in the northwest and Taurus in the southwest and is a vast plateau with an average height of about 1200 meter but it is broken by ridges and volcanic outcrops. That means uh, there are some regions uh, where volcanoes have left this remnant uh, and that is volcanic outcrop. Uh, now, Easterns must be mindful of this fact that uh, it means that uh, Turkey had experienced amount of volcanic activity. The main rivers draining uh, off the plateau, that means the two rivers that originate from the plateau are going to be Tigris and Euphrates uh, and then they go on to pass through Iraq, draining themselves uh, through Shat al Aram. Eastern Turkey, located within the western plateau of the Armenian highland, has a more mountainous landscape and is home to the to these two rivers, Euphrates and the Tigris, uh, as well as another of this river that is Aras. That may not be so significant, uh, but uh, it is in the eastern portion of Armenian highland that lies uh, Mount Ararat. Turkey is bordered by eight countries and that is pretty significant, eight countries. Turkey is going to be bordered by eight countries, which is one of those countries that is bordered by the largest number of countries in the world. And these countries are Greece and Bulgaria to the northwest, Georgia to the northeast, Armenia, the Azerbaijan and Clave of Nakhchivan and Iran to the east and Iraq and Syria to the south. Moreover, there are going to be some water bodies also that are going to encircle it. For example, the country encircled on three sides. One is that with the Aegean Sea, that is towards the west. That is, the, this color is completely black because of a, because a, a lot of anaerobic decomposition takes place in it. It used to be therefore called by the name of Yuxine Sea in the past. So black Sea that is going to be in the north and the Mediterranean Sea is going to be the south. Additionally, the Bosphorus, the Sea of Marmara and the Dardanelles uh, together form the Turkish Straits. Uh. These are the three of these regions that go on to form the Turkish Straits uh, and divides uh, Thrace and Anatolia that separates Europe uh, from Asia. Ankara lies to the south of the Black Sea to the edge of the Anatolian Plateau and the capital of uh, Turkey. But Istanbul is situated on a peninsula surrounded by three sides, surrounded on three sides by water. Istanbul has a very, very, very strategic location because it is surrounded on three sides by water and the three states that cover it the Sea of Marmara, the Bosphorus Strait, and the Golden Horn. An important tourist center, Istanbul, that it is, it is one of the most historic and cosmopolitan cities together, both of them taken together. It is in Turkey lies the westernmost point of Asia as well, and that is Bozka Adasi.
Now, that forms a one part of our journey. Afghanistan, Iran, Iraq and Turkey. Lying westward and southward of uh, Turkey are the Levant countries. Yeah. Levant countries comprise of uh, Cyprus, one that is one, Syria, Turkey, Lebanon, Israel and some portions of Egypt as well. Cyprus is an island country in the eastern Mediterranean and the most popular island, most po um, populous island in the whole of the Mediterranean. Cyprus is located south of Turkey, west of Syria and Lebanon, northwest of Israel, north of Egypt and southeast of Greece. Cyprus has been divided since 1974 when Turkey invaded the north in response to military coup on the island which was uh, backed by the Athens government. The island was effectively partitioned with uh, the northern third that was inhabited by the Turkish Cypriots, uh, that means uh, the people uh, who were of Turkish origin and living in Cyprus uh, and uh, the southern two-thirds uh, by the Greek Cypriots, that means the people of Cyprus uh, who had an affinity and origin associated with Greece. Uh. Cyprus is one of those countries torn apart uh, between conflict uh, and the uh, United Nations troops uh, patrol the green line that is dividing the two parts of it. Uh. That is two parts of Turkey, one dominated by the Greek and another and another dominated by that of uh, the Turkish people. Uni reunification talks uh, have proceeded only slowly and it is still an island of a strife, one beautiful island actually that has been in strife. Second of this Levant country happens to be Syria. Syria in Western Asia has borders with Lebanon and the Mediterranean Sea to the west. It has Turkey in the north, Iraq to the eastern, Jordan to the south and Israel to the southwest. That goes on to make up uh, the countries that go on to be bordering Syria. The western two-thirds of Syria is uh, uh, Syria's Golan Heights. Uh, western two-thirds of Syria happen to be Golan Heights, uh, which have been since 1967 Israel by Israel, and uh, were in 1981 effectively annexed by Israel. Israel got it annexed. Israel had annexed good number of territories in this place, whereas the eastern third of uh, Syria. Uh, is controlled by Eastern Third is controlled by Syria with the UNDOF maintaining a, a buffer zone in between to implement the ceasefire. And it is this place where the ceasefire has been maintained that's called by the name of Purple Line. So the students must go on to remember two different types of lines in this case. One is uh, the green line that is uh, separating uh, the Greek and the Turkish uh, Cypriots, uh, that's one. And the second is the purple line that exists in this place. Uh, that is a, a ceasefire line that exists within Syria. Similar type of lines had been to an extent, if not very discernible, had been Belgium as well. That is that between the Flemish population and the French population. So maybe if it is going to be about lines in the color of the lines, then these three countries can go on to be on the same footing. Syria is a country of fertile plains, high mountains, and deserts. Syria is also home to diverse type of religious groups, ethnic groups, and these groups going to comprise of the Syrians, the Arabs, the Greeks, the Armenians, Assyrians, the Kurdish people as well, Syrascians and Mandians as well, as well as the Turks. Religious groups are going to be Sunnis, Christians, Alawites, the Druzes, Ismails, Albites and Druzes also going to be in Le Lebanon, eh? Mandians, eh? Shiites, eh? that means Sunni and Shiites, eh? Selfazis, Yazidis are going to be significant, eh? Yazidi are significant and the Jewish population. Sunni make up eh? the largest group in Syria and eh? it's eh, one of eh, those eh, groups that goes on to maintain its hegemony in the region as well. The Syrian civil war is an ongoing multi-sided armed conflict in Syria fought primarily between the government of President Bashar al-Assad along with its allies and various forces that go on to be opposing the government. 
The unrest in Syria is part of a wider wave of 2011 Arab Spring protests, which grew out of a discontent with the Assad government and escalated to an armed conflict after protests calling for the removal were having a very violent connotation. Of course, they have been suppressed since then. The war is being fought by several factions, the Syrian government and its allies, a loose alliance of the Sunni rebel armed Arabian group, then including the Free Syrian Army and the majority of the Kurdish population. Kurdish population which goes on to be organizing itself in the form of Syrian democratic forces. Then a Salafi jihadist group as well, including a Al Nasra Front and the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant. There is ISIL, Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant. It has not to be confused with ISIS. With a number of countries in the region and beyond, uh, and beyond being either directly involved or rendering support to one or the other faction, such type of war is going to be called by the name of internecine warfare. In an internecine warfare, there is no country, there is no party that is going to be involved that goes on to be a winner. Everyone goes on to be a loser in this front. The Syrian conflict represents a proxy war among great powers. This is largely because if you can go on to say it euphemistically, that is, the US is involved, Russia is involved. One of these main interests of Russia is uh, to take its pipelines through Syria. United States doesn't want its pipeline to move through Syria and then, then come into the Mediterranean Sea. For Russians, it will be a great victory if they can go on to find their pipeline moving uh, through Syria into the Mediterranean Sea. For the USA, it will go on to pose a threat to its economy because it wants to maintain its uh, hegemony over oil. Important cities in the news eh, <coughs> are always going to be uh, the sites of strategic importance eh, and one of them is going to be Aleppo. Aleppo is one of the oldest continuously inhabited cities in the world. We repeat it like uh, Assyria, like uh, Byblos, eh, like, uh, like Ulysses. Eh, all of these uh, are have been one of these uh, most important, one of these oldest inhabited cities in the world. So candidates have to take a look at uh, two of these cities. Aleppo has been one of them. That is in news. Uh, Biblos has been there. Ugrate has been there. Knossos has been also there. Just for the purpose of a cross-reference, uh, which may be possibly asked. Uh, the northern Syrian city of Aleppo was uh, caught in a brutal four-year deadlock. Uh, it was a key battleground in the war between forces loyal to President Bashar al-Assad uh, and rebels uh, who wanted to overthrow him. In November, the Syrian government forces launched a renewed assault and rapidly retook almost all of these opposition-held eastern portion. By mid-December, they had pushed the rebels into just a few neighborhoods. Palmyra is an ancient city situated on the Chinese Silk Route. It was one of those cities that was destroyed by the ISIS. Militants destroyed the <clears throat> loin of Al Alat and other statues. Now, that was uh, this loin is uh, significant. There are two loins uh, in this region that are significant. Uh, one of this has been destroyed uh, by the ISIS militants. Uh, the other loin doesn't have, has not been destroyed, and that exists in uh, Brussels. Uh, it, exi it exists in Belgium. That is going to be in Lucerne, or weeping loin. Now, the, so uh, statues of loin go on to be having some degree of a co relationship uh, here. A weeping loin in Lucerne in Switzerland, and uh, then uh, that is going to be another of it, the loin statue here. One of these loin statues had been in Belgium, but then that has been unknown by and large. So, this uh, loin of Al Latte and other statues has um, come days after the militants guarded the citizens uh, and promised not to destroy the city's monuments. Uh. Now, they have been more of a vandalist uh, of a sort. Uh. It is this vandalism uh, that had been uh, responsible also in uh, the destruction of the Bamiyan Buddha in uh, Afghanistan. So when you are going to be talking about uh, an uh, international warfare and another is going to be that of uh, vandalism, uh, then it is out of sheer vandalism and hatred that Bamiyan Buddha has been destroyed and this line has been destroyed as well. The third of this city has been Raqqa. 
ISIL took complete control of Raqqa and destroyed the city's Shia mosques and Christian churches. The Christian population of Raqqa, which had an estimated to be something like 10% of the total population before the civil war began, had largely fled the city. Now, more than 90% of Raqqa city has been leveled due to the deliberate and barbaric bombardment of the city and the towns near, near it by the alliance forces, which also destroyed all services and infrastructures and forced tens of thousands of locals to leave the city and become refugees. Syria considers Raqqa to be an occupied city and it can only be considered liberated when the Syrian Arab army enters into it and that is the point of a discord in the region. The last of this city that is going to be significant here, going to one of these last is Damascus. Damascus is the capital and likely, likely to be the largest city of Syria following the decline of the population of Aleppo. Damish came into prominence only because of it. And the more significant part is, which is likely to be as case Latakia on the that is the chief seaport of Syria on the Mediterranean coast. Lebanon is the third Levant country. Lebanon, officially known as the Lebanese Republic, is a sovereign state of Western Asia. It is bordered by Syria to the north and east and Israel to the south, while Cyprus is west across the Mediterranean Sea. Lebanon's location is at the crossroads of the Mediterranean Basin and the Arabian hinterland. Lebanon has been ravaged first by an internecine conflict between the Muslims and the Christians, and these were the two people who were again, these are the two sects, Albites and the Druzes, we have referred to them, Albites and the Druzes. They have been, that had been a war between these two of them and they have been now protecting the religious faiths in the mountains of Lebanon and they are the one who have been caught in the crossfire of ISIS. Jordan lies on the east bank of Jordan River, one of these smallest rivers. Jordan is bordered by Saudi Arabia to the south, Iraq to the northeast, Syria to the north, Israel and Palestine to the west. The Dead Sea lies along its western borders and that also separates it with Israel. So Dead Sea goes on to be one of these buffer zones that go on to lie between Jordan and that of Israel. The country has a small shoreline, that means the portion that goes on to be touching the sea. So it has a small shoreline on the Red Sea side in its extreme southwest, having one of the smallest shorelines in the world although it is by and large landlocked. This shoreline can go to measure anything between 21 to 22 kilometers. And that's where you're going to find Aqaba. Aqaba is the only port of the country and is going to be in the Gulf of Aqaba. Jordan is strategically located at the crossroads of Asia, Africa and Europe. Effectively, if you can go to say it so, then Jordan had a very good location from the perspective of a crisscrossing of the roadways and even airways as well. But then Kuwait took its advantage, Jordan had not been able to take it, largely because of the conflicts that have been there. One must go on to remember it was in Jordan that there was a city that was called as Azraq. That was, it was here. Uh, that a good number of people had been liberated sometime in the back and one of these biggest airlifting operations took place in Azraq operated by Air India. Israel lies on the southeastern shore of the Mediterranean Sea and the northern shore of the Red Sea. It has land borders with Lebanon to the north, Syria to the northeast, Jordan in the east and the Palestinian territories of the West Bank and the Gaza Strip east and west respectively and Egypt to the southwest. Israel's economy and technology center is Tel Aviv, while its seat of government and proclaimed capital is Jerusalem. Of course, it's in news now even endorsed by the United States. The state sovereignty over East Jerusalem is not recognized internationally and it has been an effort to allow it to be recognized. Logically, it may be correct, but ethically, it may not be correct from an international affairs viewpoint. 
There are a good number of controversial spots in Israel. One of them is the Golan Heights. The Golan Heights is simply the Golan is a region in the Levant spanning about 1800 square kilometers. The region eh, defined as the Golan Heights differs eh, between disciples, disciplines, eh, differs between disciplines eh, and eh, as a geological and a biogeographical region. Geological because it's made of basalt and biological because uh, biogeographical because of uh, some other factors, particularly as a uh, as a hot seat of a lot of plants and animals. So the Golan Heights is a basaltic plateau bordered by the Yarmouk River in the south and the Sea of Galilee and Hula Valley in the west. And that is significant. Yarmouk River in the south, Sea of Galilee and uh, the Hula Valley in the west. The until Lebanon and the Mount Hermon, that means until Lebanon is a mountain in the Mount Hermon in the north and uh, Wadi Rad Rakkad in the east. It's a valley. Wadi means in this place it's a valley. Wadi Radak in the east and as a geopolitical region as well. It is indeed a major geopolitical region. The Golan Heights is an area captured from Syria and occupied by Israel during the Six Day War territory which uh, uh, Israel went into an accident in 1981. Of course, Israel at that point was powerful and it had a, a major backing of United States. Eh? And of course, it had a, its own F-16 aeroplanes eh? with the help of it. Eh? It was able to do a lot of damage to the Arabian countries. Eh? The Arabian countries have been nursing their wounds since then eh, against Israel. This region includes the western two-thirds of the geological Golan Heights eh? as well as the Israeli occupied part of Mount Hermon. So that was Golan Heights. The second is Gaza Strip. The Gaza Strip or simply Gaza is a small self-governing Palestinian territory on the eastern coast of the Mediterranean Sea. That borders Egypt on the southwest and Israel on the east and north along a 51 kilometer border that, that is a, a part of it. As it can be seen in the map itself, Gaza together with the West Bank it constitutes a the Palestinian territories claimed by the Palestinians eh, as the state of Palestine. The territories of Gaza and the West Bank are separated from each other by the Israeli territory. And that is surprising. Both fall under the jurisdiction of the Palestinian Authority, but Gaza has since eh, June 2007 been governed by the Hamas, a Palestinian Islamic organization, and we are not calling it as eh, by the name of a terrorist organization. That's of course not going to be done largely because it's going to bring up a lot of subjectivities, Hamas. Israel has uh, two absolutes. One of them is uh, from a, from a ge geographical point of view, it's two absolutes. Uh, one is uh, Tirat Tavi. Tirat Tavi is the place that has recorded the highest temperature in Asia. That is, it's the hottest place in Asia. Like the coldest place in Asia is going to be Varkhoyansk. Eh? It's the hottest place in eh, Asia. We are not talking about the hottest place in Africa, that is Al Azizia, and the hottest place in North America, that is in also the world, that is <coughs> Death Valley. So, three names that you can remember Tirat, Tavi, Al Azizia, and the third is Death Valley. The second of this absolute is going to be Dead Sea. Dead Sea is an example of Rift Valley Lake, eh, that the second deepest lake in the whole of the world after Lake Baikal and lies along the west bank of Jordan. The East African Rift Valley begins from here, that is the beginning of the East African Valley takes place from here itself. It is bordered by Jordan to the east and Israel and Palestine to the west. Eh. The Dead Sea is a 304 meter deep, the deepest hypersaline lake in the world that is suprasaline. Now, understand two more things. Sir. Dead Sea is very saline. We have talked about Lake One as well. Lake One is uh, going to be the third saline body of uh, water in the whole of the world. So, while Dead Sea is going to be the deepest hypersaline lake in the world, the lake that goes on to have the highest salinity that is Don Juan Pond that is in Antarctica. So there are three facts that are very clear. Don Juan Pond is the shallowest lake in the whole of the world that is ankle deep water, barely ankle deep water. Dead Sea is the deepest hypersaline lake in the world and Lake Juan is going to be the third lake with the highest salinity. It is 
almost 9.6 times as salty with a salinity of 342 gram per kg or 34.2 or more than 34.2 percent that is as compared to other of them so it's going to be one of the saltiest bodies of water in the whole of the world the dead sea water has a density of 1.24 gram per liter which makes swimming similar to that of floating it's like you can go to find someone floating in the Dead Sea, reading a newspaper and maybe sipping a glass of wine also, keeping the bottle on their chest. It's called as dead because it has a virtually no aquatic life because of high salinity and the resultant toxicity. The southern portion of, it, of Israel is just going to be Sinai Peninsula. The Sinai Peninsula, simply Sinai, is a triangular peninsula in Egypt, is situated between Mediterranean and the Red Sea. It is bounded towards southwest and southeast by the Gulf of Suez and the Gulf of Aqaba. It is the only part of Egyptian territory which is located in Asia. Now that again goes on to be significant because it is these exceptional and uh, unique aspects that are generally going to be asked to you in the examination. It serves as a land bridge between two continents. Uh, the peninsula's eastern shore separates the Arabian plate from the African plate. Sinai is of immense strategic significance as any control over Sinai will allow the controlling powers to regulate world's most important oil traffic route along the Suez Canal. Because lying on the Suez Canal, you are virtually able to man the whole of the Suez Canal. Suez Canal opens into Red Sea. And uh, Red Sea has many associated uh, lakes as well as features. The Red Sea has uh, many associated geographical locations and features. One of them is Gulf of Aqaba. The Gulf of Aqaba or Gulf of Aliyat is a large gulf at the northern tip of Red Sea, east of the Sinai Peninsula and west of the Arabian mainland. Its coastline is divided between four countries, Egypt, Israel, Jordan, and Saudi Arabia. Now that is surprising because it is going to be by Saudi Arabia as well. It is here that Jordan shares the world's shortest coastline. That's one. Second is the Red Sea itself. Red Sea also called the Eritrean Sea. It's also going to be called by the name of Eritrean Sea is the northernmost tropical sea is a sea water inlet of the Indian Ocean lying between Africa and Asia. The connection to the ocean is in the south through Babel Mandeb Strait, that is one of these straits, Babel Mandeb and the Gulf of Aden. The Red Sea is a global 200 eco region. The sea is underlain by the Red Sea Rift, which is a part of the East African Rift Valley. The Red Sea is noted for its red algae, which gives its characteristic marine colors and the life of the coral cell. The sea is the habitat of over more than 1,000 invertebrate species and 200 soft and hard corals. The corals that are found here are the only corals in the world that can go on to survive temperature fluctuations. There are no corals nowhere in the world that can go on to survive so much amount of a temperature fluctuation as the corals found in Red Sea are able to survive. They are therefore exceptional. Since the Red Sea links the petroleum rich regions of Arabia, it is of a stra immense strategic significance here. Passing through the Red Sea is the highest density of optic fiber cable also that converges in the Gulf of Suez. So there are two major strategic significance. One of them is a, there is a, a majority of a, the oil traffic passes through Red Sea, that's one. And that uh, the highest density of optic fiber cable converges in the Gulf of Suez. The third of this feature is the Babel Mandeb. The Babel Mandeb, which is sometimes called as the Mandab Strait uh, or the Mandeb Strait, is a strait located between the borders of Yemen on the Arabian Peninsula and Zibati and Eritrea on the Horn of Africa. It connects the Red Sea to the Gulf of Aden. The Babel Mandeb acts as a strategic link between the Indian Ocean and the Mediterranean Sea, via the Red Sea and the Suez Canal as an oil passage. 
Now it is here that there is a choke point that is going to be available and it is one of those type of choke points that there are going to be two such type of choke points. One is going to be in the Hormuz Strait and the second is going to be in this region, Mandeb Strait. Yemen has the advantage of controlling this uh, strait and because of the Perim Islands which splits the strait into two channels. Uh, the strait is, uh, it is, uh, it is largely because of the Perim Islands that uh, Yemen is in a better position to control it. The strait is the root of 7% of international oil and more than 21,000 trade ships. Uh, although these countries have sovereignty rights over it, the US has established military paths ports in this place and they are going to military stations. One of these military stations is going to be in Sokotra. As we talked about, the region forms an important choke point like that of Hormuz. It will going to be clear from the map that is given to you that is, these are the choke points, two more important choke points here. Sokotra <coughs> is a part of Yemen. It's a small archipelago, four islands in the Indian Ocean. The largest island, also called as Sokotra, is about 95% the landmass of the archipelago. An archipelago is a group of islands. It's not one island, but one, two, three, four, ten islands of sorts. The island is one of these most isolated islands to build as most isolated islands in the whole of the world, and one of the not the most. It is the most alien looking place on the earth as well. This is largely because a third of its plant life is found nowhere else on the whole of the planet. There are over 300 unique species of plants that are going to be found in this place and the most important of which is dragon's blood. Dragon's blood is a unique, exceptional and extraordinary plant, the shape of which is unique, the form of which is unique, the life of which is unique and the ecosystem surrounding also is unique. These three regions eh, form what we are going to call it as a Southwest Asia. If you recall, we began our journey all the way from the Persian Gulf, went on to move into the Levant region, first Afghanistan, then eh, Iran, then Iraq, then Turkey, then coming into Cyprus, then coming into Syria, that was Israel, Jordan, then then it was in Arabian Sea region and it is a Arabian Sea and Persian Gulf that goes on to confine the whole of the Arabian Peninsula which is mostly going to be on the land and it's a peninsula of such. That is how the whole of the scheme of his study was framed. Lying southwest of the Persian Gulf, of course, and lying to the northeast of the Red Sea is uh, the Arabian Peninsula. Arabian Peninsula is uh, effectively a subcontinent of Asia, but it is the largest peninsula in the world. The Arabian Peninsula compares itself very favorably with uh, the major peninsula of the world, that is the southern part of the, our country, that is India. It compares very favorably because both of them have been intrinsically linked with each other from a geological perspective. But the USP of Arabian Peninsula, the most important aspect of Arabian, Arabian Peninsula is its dry climate. The whole of the peninsula is a desert. Consequently, it comprises many deserts and the deserts whose base is a sandy. So it comprises many sandy deserts including the largest sandy desert in the world. Rub al Khali, then the Nefud in the Nefud Desert in the north, which is a stony desert. That means eh, there is a bare rock that is going to be found on the surface, and there are going to be sharp fragments of stones that go to lie on them. In between the Rub al Khali and Nefud lies Dana Desert. Now that goes on to become significant because this can be asked in the form of a question. There is a Dahna lies between which two type of deserts in this case. So one of these features of Arabian Peninsula is a, a desert. The second is a, the ranges. The most important of these ranges is the Hijaz ranges. 
and uh, these are the range of mountains that forms uh, the boundary towards the Red Sea coast uh, on the west and also at the south uh, east end of the peninsula that is towards Yemen. Other than mountains uh, and deserts, uh, it has oasis. Uh, oasis uh, is uh, a piece of uh, a land uh, where the groundwater can come on to the surface. It has two large oases. Uh, one of them is Al Hasa and Al Katif that permit palm tree cultivation. However, both the oases, uh, that means uh, the oasis and the groundwater, both of them are being rapidly depleted in the whole of the uh, Arabian Peninsula. And that goes on to be a major cause of concern for the whole of the world. Most of the oasis and marshy coastlands are in eastern Arabia in the Arabian Gulf side, that means towards the Persian Gulf region. The peninsula constituent countries are, that is taking it clockwise from the north to south are Kuwait, Bahrain, Qatar the, and the United Arab Emirates on the east. Oman on to the southeast, Yemen on to the south, and Saudi Arabia at the center. It is these countries that have formed some type of regional groupings as well. For example, there are six countries that is Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Bahrain, Qatar, United Arab Emirates, and the Oman form the Gulf Cooperation Council. Now, this, these countries are significant because you have to understand it from a different perspective. The question that can be framed to you in the prelims is that which of these following countries are not part of the Gulf Cooperation Council? Second such type of a grouping is going to be the Arab League. Arab League is another important regional organization which is 22 countries both from Africa and Arabian Peninsula and is frequently in the news. Now, Following Gulf Cooperation Council, it's not that a question can be asked which of the following countries is not in the Arabian League because uh, out of 22 countries, it will going to become difficult uh, for uh, any candidate to remember the name. But maybe there are going to be some conspicuous names uh, which can be something uh, like Afghanistan, which may not going to be a part of Arabian League or Pakistan, which can going to be a part of it. Although this, this is how exactly is a... Uh, a tactical part of uh, answering a question. Then there are going to be individual countries uh, which are significant. For example, one of these individuals, the island country of Bahrain, which lies to of the east coast of the peninsula. Bahrain has uh, one of these aviation hubs and it goes on to be an emerging aviation hub and one of the fastest growing economies of the whole of the world. One of these economies in the whole of the world where a woman can go on to be a pilot in the case. UAE, United Arab Emirates, is a federation of seven emirates and was established in 1971. The constituent emirates are Abu Dhabi, which serves as the capital, Azman, Dubai, Fuzera, Ras al Khama, Sharjah, Umm al Quran. And each of these emirates is governed by an absolute monarch. Together, they jointly form the Federal Supreme Council. One of the monarchs, that is traditionally always has been the Emir of Abu Dhabi, is selected as the President of the United Arab Emirates. Now, whenever there is going to be a departure, that can go on to become one of the questions that can be framed in the prelims examination. The UAE's oil reserves are the seventh largest in the whole of the world, while its natural gas reserves are the world's seventeenth largest. It is this oil and gas reserves that goes on to run the economy of a whole of UAE. The UAE's economy is the most diversified in the uh, in the whole of the Gulf Cooperation Council, while its most populous city of Dubai is a, an important global city and it's an international aviation hub. 
Now the most significant about Dubai is going to be its an international aviation hub. An international aviation hub is a place eh, where a lot of airlines and aeroplanes go on to converge. The convergence of a lot of airlines eh, in Dubai uh, has been given to you in this uh, world map that you're going to see on your screen. Eh, but then eh, the reasons behind Dubai emerging as an aviation hub are many of them. First is, eh, of course, not the most important is that unlike most of eh, the northern European eh, countries, eh, the snow doesn't require to be shoveled off in the winter. Say. That means that's an additional cost that is going to be required. And that's a huge additional cost that is incurred in cleaning the airports say, and, and allowing the airports to keep on functioning in the aftermath of a snowfall. That is one of them. Second is that Dubai, of course, lies almost at the center of uh, the world aviation because from Dubai, the whole of uh, United States is closer. Latin America is closer, North Europe is going to be closer, India and China are going to be closer and of course Africa is going to be closer as well. So almost 75% of the world is going to be very very close to it, not to speak of some of these countries like that of Australia, New Zealand which can go on to be closer but not as close as one can go on to think of it. But uh, it is definitely much better place in comparison to that of Frankfurt or Amsterdam of sorts. This is a third factor which has led to the rise of uh, Dubai as an aviation hub and that is uh, it's a major shopping center. So it's like a chicken and egg situation in this country which is because of a uh, shopping center or because of aviation hub the shopping center exists and because shopping center is an aviation hub. The fourth factor is a uh, Danata that is a uh, Dubai a national carrier. Emirates happen to be the airways and it's if not anything else then it's Emirates that goes on to be supporting the whole of Dubai International Airport. And the fifth is Dubai happens to be in a desert and that land acquisition is not at all a problem in this case absolutely. These are some of these factors and of course the last of this factor is the emergence of India and China as a major economy in the adjoining decades of such which has a major amount of traffic to Dubai. From the perspective of maritime location, the Arabian Peninsula is bounded by in a clockwise direction the Persian Gulf on the northeast, the Strait of Hormuz and the Gulf of Oman on the east, the Arabian Sea on the southeast and south, then the Gulf of Aden on the south. The side that goes on to face eh, main Asia is Iran and separating Iran is the Gulf of Persia. Now in this case eh, again the candidates are going to be asked to arrange all of these eh, maritime locations eh, in a clockwise and an anti-clockwise eh, manner. That is significant here as well. And eh, which are the Gulf countries? One other question that can be framed is which are these Gulf countries? Eh, and this is going to be one side that is going to be facing Asia that is a Persian Gulf is going to be Gulf countries. Of course, the countries that surrounding the Persian Gulf now called sometimes also as an Arabian Gulf are called as Gulf countries. Arabian Peninsula has a lot of troubled spots. Arabian Peninsula region in Saudi, the Crown Prince Muhammad has initiated a series of arrests against other family members of the royal family. A power struggle is emerging. And that goes on to become one of the sources of a question being asked from Saudi Arabia. But no one will ask you from the power struggle. What someone is going to ask you is that, is it that Riyadh is a, a mountainous region or is it that Riyadh is an oasis? Riyadh is actually an oasis where this, pow where this power struggle is taking place and that is the center of the power struggle. In Qatar, there was again a crisis when the GCC, that is the Gulf Cooperation Council, pitted South Saudi Arabia and UAE against uh, Qatar. That again goes on to be a point of news. And recently, UAE and uh, <coughs> Saudi Arabia have formed a group separate from that of GCC, Gulf Cooperation Council. That's another reason for the reason being in news. Then uh, Yemen, Saudi Arabia has been bombing it on the pretext of for fighting the Shia Houthi rebels. It has been one of the worst humanitarian crises. 
and that goes on to become another source of a question that is being asked from this. It's a troubled spot. Eh? Yemen and Saudi Arabia, both of them. How the rebels also go on to be a part of it. In the whole of the region, there are factors and issues like that of changing alliances. Eh? The countries keep on changing their groupings and alliances. One such grouping have been eh, that of OPEC, that is a eh, Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries. The second has been OEPIC. There is a Organization of Arab Petroleum Exporting Countries. Yeah. Now, students required to know the difference between OPEC and OEPIC. Yeah. OPEC will go on to include some of these countries like Venezuela and Nigeria as well, while OEPIC yeah, will go on to comprise only of Arabian countries. Yeah. We have already talked about the GCC, the Gulf Cooperation Council, the Arab League, and the security arc is the one that has only recently emerged in this place.